Solutions Consultant with Beyond 20. Today I want to walk you through the general use case of uh, using the ITP team map from ShareWell to enhance your out-of-the-box ShareWell implementation. Now the ITP team is for IT project tracking and it gives you a variety of items out of the box to help you manage projects through their life cycle. Now obviously each organization is going to be a little different and you're going to potentially make modifications. But today we just want to look at what's available right out of the box simply by applying the map and from there you can uh, be more familiar with how everything's working and then determine what if anything you need to change for your own system. Let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, we have here our primary ITP team implementation. Uh, we've got our project number. We can. This is coming out of a counter. Obviously we can modify this to make it uh, meet your naming standards. Perhaps we want to start at the counter at a different number than one. For example, I've got five or six examples in here. Um, or, you know, maybe you want to start it with your company abbreviation with a date timestamp and then a number however you want to manage that you can manage this counter to show your project numbers uh, you may even implement your own where every time you have a project you are responsible for inputting the project ID so as you can see whenever I change the project ID to 345 it changed I can also make it um, let's say IT Asset Management 345, and now my project is ITAM 345. So you can use the out of the box counter, it'll do that, or you can make this a text only field where it doesn't auto populate and put what you need to here. Um, obviously, it's share well, so the sky's the limit as far as automation and doing things with this. So on our main IT, uh, ITPT screen here, our main form. We have our risk assessment, and this is handled manually. Our status, uh, it does have to go through an approval request. It can go through an approval request. Obviously, anything about this you can modify. Um, our priority is a uh, one is high, five is low. So you've got one, two, three, four, five to select from. You give your project a name description. If you have portfolio IDs, you can actually select from a portfolio ID and that will show who the portfolio manager is for that uh, portfolio. So you can have multiple um, projects all running off of the same portfolio. Uh, you've got your location and then if you need to link a primary CI, you can do so. Uh, just like on incident, um, customer, etc. Uh, change management, you still have that related item pick or tool value to pick uh, primary CI for this project. As with most other objects inside of ShareWell, you've got a requester location, so you can pick the requester, it'll auto pop their uh, phone number and email. You've got a own by or project manager. Um, this is just pulling from user info, as you can tell by the IT management team here um, and the user info. So, same process that you would use inside of Incident, etc. Uh, you have a I want to section. In the I want to section, you still have the ability to take ownership. You can send a project health update. Now, this is a little interesting in that when you click this, you select what the budget health is. There's no automation behind this. What the deliverable health is, what the risk health is, and finally what the schedule health is. Once you've done that, if you hit OK, it pops an email here for you to send the addressees and then you can include any additional information that you need to. 
Now, if you noticed, since I selected medium for a couple of the items, these icons changed and showed a new health update and color. So low, medium, and then high would be red. So these are driven by you doing a project health update. You could obviously do some work with this and uh, set some automation behind it to keep track of your project. Uh, for example, you might say that you know, if there are X number of tasks open and your, you know, planned end date is less than 10 days away, you can have a number of open tasks that indicate that your project health schedule is at risk. Or if you have more than three risks that are open regardless of their impact, then your risk is high, medium, or low. So you can put some automation behind these and calculations to help uh, automate this and then you can modify this project health update to further reflect these changes um, based on what the current values are rather than being prompted. Also you'll notice here that you have notified task owners to update their tasks. Well as with most other incidents you do have a tasks uh, section where you can set different tasks to different people and when you notify task owners to update their tasks you'll get an email saying, hey, please update your open tasks so that I can update my project reports. So just a neat little addition there to uh, be able to quickly email everyone and say, hey guys, we need to update these uh, tasks on the project. Execute project. This is um, really just setting the project to active. We should get an error saying that, hey, the project needs to be approved before we can execute it. It's still under review and cannot be executed. So to get that to move forward, you need to actually have gotten approval. Now, the approval is going to go out to those who have been identified as approvers. And you'll see here now that we have approvals, we have Andrew Sims, who was identified as an approver. And I will show you that in just a moment. So Andrew would come in, approve the project. And now that it's been approved, it'll move forward. Um, we can move it forward into an execute and set it as active. So how did Andrew get to be an approver? Well, we have this tab here for project members. And within the project members, we can set different project members from both the users and the customer tables. And for example here we have Anthony Edwards who is a customer. We want Anthony to get any project notification emails and his role is an executive. Our other project member right now is a licensed shareable user who gets the project email notifications and is an approver. Uh, I apologize, I said it could be customers or users. In fact, ITPT relies on the approvers being user records. If I try to create a new ITPT project customer, I don't have the option to set them as an approver. Now, obviously, you could go in and modify this so that they can be approvers. You just have to deal with the approval object out of the box being set to pull from user info only. Um, but if we pick a project member, we can select someone from the customer table and then their role. They're a customer, an executive, a sponsor, supplier, or a team member. Now you can modify these roles that are available to meet your business needs, but it will auto pop their email address and phone. Uh, any notes that you need to make about the project member you can add here. Uh, if we select a project user, Again, we've got the project notification email, but we can also make them an approver. So whenever we have um, a new project that is waiting for approval, we can pick someone like Sawyer here, uh, make them an approver, make sure they get project notifications, and then again, we can pick their role. Let's go ahead and save this record. Now, I would go ahead and modify the system to actually take these approvals and move the status forward once the approvals have been um, gained. So like right now we have Andrew Sims, we have his approval, 
um, even though I approved it for him. You can do different things such as make a journal if someone approves it who is not the approver. You can prevent someone else from approving it other than Andrew, etc., etc. Uh, but we would want to add an automation process in here to automatically move it from awaiting approval to execute. And let's just go ahead and create a new ITPT project. So again, we're going to pick a requester. We'll make it Tracy. We're going to take ownership, and I'm going to change my team uh, to IT management. Really not relevant, but it's just for me. Uh, project IT ID, we're going to call this ITPT74. Uh, project 74 description. Description of my project. My priority is going to be three. My portfolio ID, I'm going to go ahead and select one. Location is not required. Primary CI is not required. I'm going to put my planned start date as tomorrow and my planned end date at the end of the month. Uh, we'll go ahead and save the record. Everything looks good. Let's go ahead and make some project members. So we're going to add a couple of project users. And we'll send them notifications. I'm going to grab Andrew Sims. His role is a team member. We'll save that. And then I'm just going to add another team member who will not be an approver, uh, Bruce. And his role is a team member as well. Now, let me double check. I don't believe that I, okay, I did. All right, so I have project members and an approver. So let's go ahead and request that approval. I don't have an email hooked up into this system, so I'm not going to actually get the email for Andrew. So I'll just come here and approve the project. Now that it's approved, the change that we made, uh, give Sharewell 60 to 90 seconds with the automation process engine. And we should move forward into an approval status. All right, so there's some additional work that's going to need to happen to get that to work properly. We're going to go ahead and we're going to create a one step real quickly so that we can update the approval, which I apparently have created in the past for the same reason. Yep, so we'll go ahead and run that to approve the project. And now we can execute. Now our project's active. All right. So you'll need to fix the approvals to make sure that once the approval is once the approval is approved, that it does in fact update that logical so that you can move it forward, and that the automation processes are working to set it to active. All right, so now that we have our project that's been approved, we can start working. Now, we can estimate our effort. Uh, let's say it's going to be 40 hours, and then we'll be able to say what our actual hours were. Now, a couple of other things on this is we have our business case. So we can just create business cases with our business reason, resource details, uh, and cost details. So you set your business case. And then for your deliverables, you can come in here and set a new deliverable. Give it an ID. Maybe you have ID 1. Maybe you have uh, ITPT 74-1 to show that the deliverable is matched against this project. What is the name of that deliverable? What's its description? What are the requirements? And whether or not the customer has accepted that deliverable. Uh, you can have a start and end date. Uh, here you can just keep adding deliverables as needed so that you can keep track of everything that is uh, in process here. Uh, next we have the ability to track cost items. So we're going to add a new. We can add a cost item of labor, other, provisioning, or tool. And obviously you can create your own and update these. 
So cost item on other, we're going to say it's a test. Now, was that a capital expense or an operational expense? And obviously, you might want to change these labels so they're a little more uh, self-explanatory. As you can see up here, we've got our capital expense budget and our operational expense budget. So for this one, we're going to say it's a capital expense, and we budgeted $2,500, and we spent $1,450. Once we save this, now we've got our record up here showing our capital expense budget to date is $2,500 and we've spent $1,450 of it so we still have $1,050 in our capital expense budget or our overall, overall project budget. Um, I would consider enhancing this a little bit where you can show your capital budget, your capital expenses, your operational budget and then your operational expenses so you can get a clearer picture of your total um, expenses and um, budget items rather than having to come here and look at the one by one. Um, that way, uh, you know, as I add new items, let's add a provisioning and it's going to be a current provisioning. We're still going to use capital expensing. Now we can pull a category. It's a subscription. What's our frequency? Uh, it's annual. Plus, well, since I clicked it, let's leave it biannual. And then we're going to put $50 as our budget, and our total cost is going to be $45. Now that we've saved that, our capital budget has gone up now. We started out with $2,500. We added $50. And when we change our view here, now we can see that we have these cost items and total cost. Well, I would also include our cost type so that we can see our capital and as we let's go ahead and add an operational cost in here uh, we'll make uh, Gina and it's going to be operational our budget for Gina is going to be hundred and twenty three dollars and so far we've used her um, let's say that we've used her at twenty four dollars I'm sorry, at three hours at $24 an hour. And so we've used $72 worth of our ex, um, allowed expense for GINA, or our allowed budget. Now when we view this, now we can start seeing that, hey, we've had these capital expenses and this operational expense, and see how they match up to our budget here. But again, I would... Um, expand this a little bit and add you know not only our capital expenses budget but our capital expense total our operational budget our operational total uh, so that we can see each of those individually and then our total project cost and our total project budget remaining um, and again having this cost type I would actually modify the um, add a blueprint to modify this grid to reflect this cost type information here so that at a glance you can start seeing more details. Uh, we've looked at the project members, risks and issues. We can add risk or issues, uh, decide whether it's a risk or an issue, what the description is, what the effect of that is, and then our impact. Is it low, medium, or high? Um, and then what's the status of it? So as you correct any risks or mitigate them or issues you can actually close those out and this is where I would have um, calculation going for my project risk to show you know if I have X number of open risks or issues uh, that over time a certain number of those you know an aggregate of say five open items takes the risk to a medium level or maybe five open items takes the risk high and figure out how I would like to calculate that. Uh, we can link additional configuration items to our project. Let's say we're doing a domain controller change out and to do that we've got to update all of the subdomain controllers. Maybe we've got a DNS server we've got to update, etc, etc. So we can add those additional configuration items here and just simply link those items as being impacted by this 
um, project. So maybe this file server is impacted as well. Um, and maybe this domain controller. Uh, tasks and journals work the same way. Here's our portfolio information um, so that we can see more about the portfolio itself. Our approvals, again, I would recommend adding an approval history so that we can keep track of that. Any change requests, you can link or create change requests uh, right here. So we can have changes that are part of our project. And it's not just one change. Perhaps we were going in multiple phases or we've got different changes across different days. So you can do that right from here without having to go back and forth. Uh, let's see. Meeting minutes. Here we can track our meeting minutes. And we can say this is meeting one. Uh, maybe it's our kickoff meeting. What's our category? Well, this is a deliverables, initiation, risk issues, or schedule. So our kickoff meeting is going to be initiation. Uh, what's the description? Uh, what's our status? It's new, it's on hold, it's open or closed. Uh, might change those to be you know, planned, uh, in progress, closed out. Uh, when's it due? And who's responsible for configuring or setting up this meeting? Who is... Um, who has the ball in their court to run this meeting. And then we can email the ball in court person and we can tell Andrew when it's due. Um, should have corrected that before I set the meeting. So let's go ahead and put a due date of April 2nd. And let's then we'll email Andrew and let him know that, hey, he's responsible for meeting minute one that is due. And then that will open an email. You've been assigned meeting minute one with the following details. It's a kickoff owned by the project manager. Uh, it appears that we have a issue with this email because it did not pull my name into the field. The description of our meeting is test. Due date's April 2nd, the related project. Um, and please contact me if you have any questions. So this email template also needs some modification. So anyhow, you've got all the variables, all the components that you need to successfully run a project straight out of Sherwell. Obviously, there are different things that you might want to modify uh, to meet your business requirements and needs. For example, you may want to, again, automate the naming by putting a uh, different feature here. Need to fix the issue with the approvals that once they're approved, they're not updating that logical field to allow you to and or to automatically move your project into an active status. Um, might want to look at automation on uh, dealing with these uh, icons or this legend that help you get a, at a glance view of the project instead of having to run your own project update. I would consider, if you didn't want to put the automation in, I would consider turning this into a branching one step and renaming that to be update or notify about project health so that you can run the same one step and update your project health manually and or send an email. Um, yes, you can walk through and just cancel the email portion, but that's not as... Um, clean looking or feeling as just going in and rebuilding this one step. Uh, you can notify your task owners that they need to create or update their tasks because you're in the middle of doing a project update. Uh, you can track your business case, your deliverables, and with your deliverables you can let us know whether the customer has accepted the deliverable or not. Um, you might do some additional work with this and saying that here's our deliverable. Does the customer accept that this is a deliverable? And then does the customer accept that the deliverable has been delivered? So right now the customer accepted is just a logical field that really doesn't do anything except say the customer accepted. Um, your use case may be that, hey, they've accepted that yes, this is indeed a deliverable of the project but 
its intent is that the customer has accepted that the deliverable was met. And I am, would look at making two different fields there. So one that the customer accepted it's a deliverable, and then another that says the customer accepted that it has been delivered. So you can toy with these and change them up as needed to meet your specific requirements, of course. Uh, our cost items, where we can track our budget. Recommend making sure the cost type is visible. I also recommend potentially adding your capital budget, capital expenses, and then operating budget, operational expenses, and then project expenses and project budget remaining. That way you can see per budget type uh, or cost type what has been spent under your capital, what has been spent under your operational, and then you can see what you've got left in each rather than just a general here's my project budget and then having to come in here and start looking for things.